grandfather, Christopher Howard, came to Corston, but he lived in the White House uh, in Chapel Street, where the winery is now, and he died, uh, I think, in 1900. He had a large family, um, I think five boys and a girl, and my great-uncle was William Arthur Howard, and my grandfather was Marshall Howard. And William Arthur started our family building business in 1886, and my grandfather took it over when he retired, give or take 1900. This um, is September 1909, and all these people were directly employed by my grandfather. That's my grandmother, grandfather, my father, and Sally the little dog. And all these people were carpenters, bricklayers, you name it. You can see the marketplace behind. That's where it was taken down at our building. And that, that building there was our drying shed where we dried all the timber. And in 1900, my grandfather bought from the Hayden Estate um, the Hayden Estate Brickyard, which is where we are today. And it, it was a working brickyard. And he continued to make bricks there until... 1926 when he ran out of brick earth. Grandfather felt that if my father was going to take over the building business he needed to do a proper apprenticeship which he did and he joined him in the business in 1929. Anything to do with the house was all built in-house in our builder's yard in New Street in Causton. We were undertakers as well, we made our own coffins and one of the last funerals we did in 1972, the complete funeral, with a bespoke oak coffin from the Sandringham estate, was charged out at £73. So I went as tailoress at Stones in Prince Wales Road for two years. F.A. Stones? Mm -hmm. That beautiful shop front yes, that used to be on yes, Prince of Wales Road. Yes. What did they get you doing there? What was I your, was, what were you I was made. I made the skirts. Did you? Yes. So you never made for me because I used to get my suits made there, my no, tweed. No, I, I, I the, there was one section of our room who made the men's trousers yeah. and another section made the men's jackets. The skirts were made there and the jackets for the ladies were made downstairs. Once, and I remember once that a lady came in, I won't mention any names, and she said, I... This is a bit too tight. So I said to the foreman, I said, uh, how much have I got to let this out? Because I've only got to be let out the, with the Nat's toenail. <laughs> so he said, go back on the press, press it out and send it back. And I did. <laughs> and that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. So what did you do after that? Well, I then wanted to come to the farm, so I gave him notice in two years to the day after I really? started. And I went home and said, Dad, I'm going to um, go to the farm now because I've given my notice in. And he said, no, you're not. You aren't gr grown up enough to do that. So he said, you can go, go and get another job. So I, I had been going to visit Little Plumstead, so I went and got a job at Little Plumstead. And I stopped there for two years. We did a sort of a trying to get um, people to join the nursing at um, the Old Curls. And which one is this? That's, is, that's me. you. That's me. My goodness, beautifully turned out. When we were working, we were not allowed to have anything on that was with pins. On, or if you see these uniforms, they were all done up from behind. There was nothing on the front of us. These are, these are the patients of really? Little Plumstead. But they look like schoolgirls. Well, yes, Well, they, they were called the schoolgirls because they used to have to go to school. And they were presented at Easter time with Easter egg. So how long did it take for you to train? <coughs> well, I never did finish training <laughs> because I left and went to, to the farm when I was 19. I worked with nine... At that time, there was nine men in my cell. Oh, I see. And uh, so I wouldn't let the men do anything that I couldn't do. Well, I never. I've yeah. been top and beat and <laughs> pulling the knot and top and beat and everything. And then as the... Years went on, we got better machinery, um, and we had a dryer, and I was the one who did all the drying in the harvest time, and mm -hmm. kept a record of where the corn had gone to, and who that was got to be sold to, and marked it all down, and, and oh. I was shocked up. Have you? Yes, I've been shocked up. I used to pick them up, and stoops, and, and stand them like that, and then they would, some, the air would get through the bottom, and the sun would get the 
and um, dry them off. Because I'd done 40 years on the farm, putting for the long service medal. My uh, word. And that, and that was presented at the Norfolk show? Show, yes. Because I think you're being very modest about that. That's quite an achievement. This is a beautiful picture of Peggy. And that is this uh, your... Jimmy, my husband. Jimmy, yeah. your husband. So um, when did you get married? 1947. This is actually my aunt and uncle, who, my aunt over there, who we've been talking about. He was the farmer and she was, it was on their wedding day. So I copied it into part, with poetry. So just after the war? Yeah. Had your husband been away at war? No, because they were exempt, farmers were exempt. But oh, he was right. in the home, home garden. He was was it Colston? Yeah. After the war, he bought the farm. So, uh, and we farmed, what, 500 acres at one time. He hired. Now, that wasn't a cheap farm, or did he buy it outright? He bought uh, about 300, wasn't it, Beryl? 300 he owned. And now, how did paid. he manage to buy that? Hard work. And that's who taught Beryl to do everything on the farm. This is a lovely picture. And that is my Uncle Jimmy, who was aunt's husband. You see. There he is, and, and he's using a seed fiddle there. Yes, he's, and I called that the fiddle and farmer, that one. <laughs> <laughs> so this is in the 1960s? Mm hmm And he's under sowing barley using a seed fiddle. Old and he used yours. to do it to Katie, she swallowed the hate me. <laughs> and he used to go on like that and to keep his rhythm right. You've lived in Colston all your life, and so have all your ancestors. Do you have any memories and photos? The most prominent, or the one that I remember best, was um, William Wilson, who was my great-grandfather. And um, they lived in this place called the White House. This is my great-grandmother Matilda and my uncle Stanley. William Wilson was what they call a self-made man. He'd worked very, very hard, trained as a butcher in Norwich with his uncle, and then he was able to save up money and buy the farm, and they also had a slaughterhouse. And this is William's son, my grandfather, Sidney, Sidney Arthur Tudnam Wilson, I would have you say. Now, he had been brought up in Norwich, and um, I think he was somewhat spoiled. He loved music, he loved drawing, um, but sadly for him, his father was determined that he'd have to work in the slaughterhouse and kill animals and things like that. And he had a bit of a problem because he used to faint at the sight of blood. This is a picture of them outside their shop. Great-grandfather William, Sidney, who's that young lad there, and nephew Clifford, the other side of the family. This, this gentleman here, Sidney, married this young lady here, who's called Hilda, and that's my grandmother. And that's her father, Frederick, and Mary Jane, and Nellie. This is a beautiful picture. Oh, nice. Tell us about who's, who's on here. Well, that would, that would be my mother. That would be her sister. Uh, and this would be her uh, sister and a mother. There's an old Norfolk saying, isn't there? He a far got dicky ball. That's right. A that was what? their dicky. That's the dicky. <laughs> now, is that little little donkey cart... And do you, do you know, where would they just have that for running about the area, would they? Well, my grandfather, her father, was a sheep shearer. And he went round to all the farms. I see. So regularly shearing and up And I think he went out of Norfolk by what my mother used to say. Really? Yeah. This is really lovely. <laughs> it says, on as seen on the road from Corston to Hayden. <laughs> and that's drawn by a little girl. To it was sent to my mother when she was a little girl. And when was that? 1904. Oh, yeah. And you stayed in your family archive for all these years. <laughs> I think that's lovely. I know for a fact that this was one of the first cars in Corston, and we have the bill for it here. It was second-hand, eight, ten-horsepower Derrick, two-seater, and my grandfather bought it from J.J. Wrights of Deerham, um, from, and they had got it from the Reverend Pease, who was the incumbent at Hayden. That's my grandfather and, and that's, that's my dad and they're on the Norwich Road at Corston near where Billy Hutton's butcher shop used to be wow. and he's taking him away to Norwich High School for Boys in Upper St Giles when he left Corston School. <laughs> that's Charles Howard Bullock and he's holding one of two little Jack Russell puppies. 
Now, these Jack Russell puppies flew up from Bristol in a mosquito bomber to having that, and they must be the fastest travelled back Jack Russells in the world, I should think. Now, Corson has quite a business in its own right, yeah. in the form of the winery. Do you know, you, you worked there for a while, I gather? I worked there from 1971 until I retired, yes. So the Corson winery was going quite a few years before you joined it? Uh, Mr Engelhart and his family, they, they had started a, a fresh life here in England and after the war, and they were, they were doing their own, uh, making sachets and Camden tablets and all that, and packing in their kitchen. From there they moved on to a, uh, to a little place uh, in Halston they, they rented and they then started producing the wine in a can with an uh, A1 machine by hand and they built the business up through the shops then and then they moved on to North Walsh make packing station, took that over. That then, they outgrew that then and then moved to Corston. We, um, we had a, a, a tank that came in from Cyprus and that was a new type but with a rubber bag inside a container and that pulled up outside to be unloaded, as usual, and uh, we had Philip uh, Pummel, who was uh, in the laboratory, he came out and tested it. Well, they opened the doors to this here container, and unbeknown to them where the wooden barrier was across, because that was a plastic uh, rubber bag, where that was sent for, for convenience, so it could be shipped back to Cyprus just on the plane, the bag. And uh, there was three and a, three, 3,000 something gallons in, in one bag. And uh, he got, climbed up on top to take a test out of the bag. <laughs> and as he, as he climbed up, by unknown, the, the, the big barrier board fell out and the whole bag split and that flooded Chapel Street. <laughs> and Philip Pummel come, come sliding out of, the, out of the trial, out of the tank, <laughs> on the grape juice, as though he was coming down a river. <laughs> Have you got any stories from when you worked at Bernard Matthews? Well, we had students come in the summer and they used to come, foreign students they were, and they used to come for about a fortnight or a month and because they tea was five o'clock and we were then coming home and they were all in the canteen eating the food and when we got home, someone said, "Some, I think that was a chap lived down the road, he come up, he said, do you know the factory's on fire? I said, no, we only know come from there. <laughs> And um, But we went in the next morning, but oh dear, the mess. Our canteen, there was all the empty plates with the food still on them, you know, they'd had to get up and go. Yeah. 